Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Alex Bernard, Associate Editor of Fruit and Vegetable Magazine. I'm joined today by Carrick Cox, Associate Professor at Cornell University, and Anne McRae, BASF Technical Service Specialist in Horticulture. Before we begin, I'd like to thank BASF for sponsoring this webinar. BASF has a diverse portfolio of crop protection products to help you manage key apple pests all season long to maximize the yield and quality of your crop. Today, during our free 60-minute session, Carrick and Anne will review the efficacy of Marivon against apple scab and apple powdery mildew over several seasons in the temperate climate of eastern North America, while also looking at the status of resistance to SDHI fung fungicides in apples and reviewing strategies to minimize the selection for SDHI-resistant orchard populations. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees and registrants approximately 24 hours after our live broadcast. This session is scheduled to run for approximately 60 minutes. Carrick and Anne will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, at which point we will start the Q&A period. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the questions tab found on the right-hand side of your screen. Without further ado, I'll let Carrick take it away. I will go ahead and take it away. And everyone hopefully can see the presentation. Uh -huh. yeah, all right. And now that we're starting, would you like me to turn off my webcam now that the intro is over? Someone can just text in there. Is that a yes? Let's turn our webcams off. Okay, bye bye. All right, let's do it. All right, use of Aaron and apples efficacy. We'll talk about resistance management. Well, if we get far enough, we'll talk about some sustainable disease management programs. A lot of the work that I'll be showing today was done by my student, Katrin, and I at um, Cornell Agritech, which is located in Geneva, New York. All right, so three different um, aspects today. Apple scab, powdery mildew trials, SDHI management, and some of the work we're doing on integrating uh, SDHI fungicides with biopesticides as well, if we cover all of it. So um, apple scab and uh, powdery mildew has been a pretty big uh, concern in 2020. Um, and mostly, it, it really depends on what you get. In 2020, we had a lot of low, um, very low number of infection periods, uh, less than three inches of rainfall. And when this happens, powdery mildew becomes a bigger concern. Now in 2019, we had 15 or so inches of rainfall and then apple scab became a big concern. And um, for the most part, what we have in terms of fungicides, uh, the SDHI fungicides remain very effective for apple scab, um, but sometimes they can be more challenging for mildew. And we'll see that as we, we go along. Um, for the most part, we had this warm dry weather in 2020 and I'll show both 2019 and 2020 data. And you can see how the level of apple scab and level of mildew played out. And it was a really strong year for powdery mildew in 2020 with all the dry weather, much more so than 2019. Uh, in terms of what our trial site looks like, we don't like to have really nice orchards like the one I showed on the splash side for um, apple scab and powdery mildew trials. We typically like these really grubby wild trees that have a lot of inoculum and a lot of disease pressure. Really allows you to see how the materials really perform in, in sort of the worst case scenario. And so we have this three and a half acre planting of Jonah Golden Empire, really widely spaced plots. That way, when we apply something like Miravon, it isn't hitting the trees next door or interfering with some of the other plots around. So it's really a, a research orchard. And what you can see is we have two cultivars. The Empire gets tons of apple scab and looks kind of fine. The Jonah Gold, which is really runty, is really susceptible to mildew and it gets devastated and defoliated very early on. And you can see this is a check tree. It looks like it has been devastated and defoliated. So uh, what we have is we use a, a fairly standard rate for the US of about 100 gallons an acre, sort of our, our volume. Um, these orchards would take approximately about 300, but you know I can get close to the tree and sort of avoid the wider spacing that such a, a weird orchard would take. And for the most part, uh, they apply it every week to 10 days from a phenological stage called tight cluster, which is right before the um, cluster begins to expand and turn pink, all the way to second cover, or which is about 14 to 21 days after petal fall. And then from the later on period, we just sort of 
spray the trees out after we look at the different materials. But the trees of interest, the treatments of interest are right there from that early cluster period to the about um, 21 days after petal fall. And then in any cases, we don't really skip a lot of materials. We want to go with the same schedule a grower does, and we alternate with effective standards when they're not part of the protocol. But for any of the materials like Maravon that I'll show today, we're really not going to exceed four applications, which is the maximum amount in the United States. And in the case of rating it, we look at the incidence of any lesion on leaves or fruit. If you get an apple scab lesion on a piece of fruit, it's not going to the fresh market, so you won't see it anymore. And we usually rate it in June, and most of the time late season scab in July. It takes about 14 to 21 days after that last sort of application to really begin to see the uh, influence of apple scab. And then we often rate, um, most one I will sh focus on will probably be fruit scab at September, right around the time of harvest. So that way you can really see how the whole program worked overall. Um, so I'll start with some of our 2019 data. We'll highlight... Um, uh, Maravon and all these have a lot of different competitor products and a lot of other really cool products as well. But for the most part, all the graphs are as follows. This is the incidence of apple scab. So in this particular instance, leaving a tree completely untreated resulted in about 70 to 75 percent of every piece of fruit having apple scab lesions on it. And, and this was a really weird season. I mentioned before we had about 15 inches of rain, which is a considerable amount, especially if you multiply that by 2.5 to determine the number of centimeters. And, but it was interesting because we had a lot of wet and dry periods, which allowed us to really get the applications on at the right timing. Um, the S Circadus, and, uh, which is one of the components in Maravon and the Premix Maravon do very well in this particular trial. Um, right there, we have the, um, the, the Maravon with the extra QOI Proclostrobin component, um, gives a little bit of extra boost than going with the Circadus alone. Um, and since this is a BASF, talk they probably aren't going to complain about me talking about how awesome Revisol is at the same time I won't focus on it since that's not the thing but I will circle it as it shows up in our trials as Sevia in the United States it's another DMI later in a dry year um, you can look at the first thing you can notice is in this dry year with about three inches of rain is that the level of overall apple scab is much lower 75 down to 50 in the untreated check and um, Miravon Circata still look really, really good. Let's see if our little, uh, everything looks really fantastic. They're looking pretty solid right there. We do have a strong DMI resistance in this block, but we don't have SDI resistance. And you can see where the material Endar seems to not be able to overcome the SDHI resistance. But if you were to look at something like Stevia, it's quite fine. So in our Apple scab trials, the standalone SDHI fungicides are incredibly um, effective against Apple scab, all very highly uh, um um, really good materials, really potent. Maravon itself is also very good and effective against mildew. We'll see that shortly. And most parts, DMI still work really well on DMI resistant populations in wet years, if you pick the right DMI. I won't focus too much on Sevia, but it is able to defeat the DMI resistance that we're seeing in New York. So I mentioned that Maravon was really good against mildew. Let's take a look at that. In our mildew, we see a lot of different things. We get primary mildew shoots, and this is usually the carryover from the previous season. And what we're looking to control this time is when those materials go out, are they gonna stop these new lesions from forming on the terminals of the apple trees themselves? And so this is what we might be rating in our case, any lesion right there. And sometimes we rate present severity, but the trends are very similar between whether or not it has a big powdery mildew lesion there, or the whole leaf gets covered for the most part and the tree defoliates. Um, and this, like I mentioned before, is a really challenging path of system for us to get. This was a wet year, um, but mildew pressure was still pretty decent. Um, one of the things that we do notice is that um, Maravon and Circadus are quite good. Uh, I mentioned they really shine in terms of getting apple powdery mildew. And once trees get about more than 30% of every terminal leaf with mildew on it, they look pretty bad. And so that's why I've drawn that nice green line or untreated there. Some other SDHIs don't work as well as the Circadus and the Maravon components. And um, Sebia is right there on the, the line as well. We have DMI resistance in the mildew population as well, which makes it challenging and is a good opportunity for something like Maravon. Uh, we mentioned those don't do like that good. In many instances, it really depends on how these are timed. Now, the way that BASF has allowed me to time Circadus and Maravon is to my own preference. And in these particular years that I show the data, and with that, I was able to work with them and pick some of the best timing to get apple scab and powdery mildew. In other instances, the timing is not appropriate 
to get both diseases. And I think in many cases, it's not always resistance that's causing some of these others to do less, effect, be less effective. It's just the right amount of timing. All right, so in a dry year, mildew pressure was pretty good. You can see overall, everything begins to creep up, but a lot of materials are looking um, pretty good at keeping it under that 30% incidence or making it look less like I was trying to have some sort of holiday tree in the orchard. Um, the best materials we have um, for mildew thus far still seem to be um, Circadus and the Maravon combinations. Um, some others are looking pretty reasonable as well. Any one of the materials that has a QOI component like Maravon in it that will be talked about later um, still do pretty good against mildew. Um, let's see. And in this case, in a, in a dry year, we're getting better timing as I'm getting more um, freedom to make my applications of stuff like Sevia and others and some sort of really um, tweak it for our own mildew. So, and sort of summary in this sort of brief section of the talk, Maravon, um, the uh, premix is quite excellent. Even sometimes we have QOI resistance in our mildew, it seems to just punch right through this. And it's in many cases better that that still has some QOI as well as the SDHI in it. It's a really nice combination. Standalone um, SDHI fungicides vary, but Circadus uh, one of the, has a component of Maravon in it and it does quite, um, quite nicely. Um, we're really concerned about resistance to DMIs and many instances um, we're kind of, it's hard to tell because the powdery mildew is an obligate Biotroph, which means we can't grow it and test it like we can others. Speaking of testing, we have done a lot of SDHI resistance discussions, and very briefly, I don't know if this is in the next slides, but this is what's happening. There's a little component of the electron transport chain, and oops, and there's a complex in it, and the SDHIs will bind to the complex too and interfere with breathing. It doesn't really affect my breathing because I don't have this complex in it, but fungi do. And um, what's really cute is there's a little binding pocket between these four three proteins. This A protein in the SDH or succinate dehydrogenase complex is not used, but the fungicides slap right in there and sort of stop the whole process and not allow the, um, the uh, fungus to breathe. And so early on when these were coming out for the apple scam fungus, Venturian aqualis, we did some work with some uh, early genome assemblies out of the US that we made. And uh, we've been looking for mutations, and we've even begun to look in Potosfero, um, Leucotrico, which is the powdery mildew one. And right now we have found all the residues that have typically been associated with mutations and other systems like Botrytis and Alternaria and a couple others and Sclerotinia, and we don't find these in any of these uh, R pathogens yet. So it's a great opportunity for the SDHI fungicides. We also have wild populations of the apple scab fungus that we like to collect. And you can see here, we've done a lot of work um, doing baselines where we're collecting these wild isolates and we put them all out there and we allow to see at what levels in terms of milligrams per mil, they are highly effective. And the material in Maravon is uh, flux of peroxide and it's one of the most effective um, SDHIs out there. And bear in mind that even if these do look different, the rates of the materials get adjusted so that they're all equally effective in the orchards. One of the questions that we begin to have is now that we don't have HDHI resistance, is couldn't we delay it through altering application practices? And this is one of these uh, um, sort of projects that we've been working on, and we've published this in Applied Environmental Microbiology, this particular study. The idea of um, where does the role of application dose and tank mixture influence selection? We all know it's good to mix fungicides and we don't know what dose can I use? Do I have to use the high? Do I have to use the low? And there are three basic um, sections of um, phases of resistance development. The first being emergence. Right now, you, let's just say you have a nice sensitive population. Um, the fungicides are not inherently mutagenic, regardless of what you might be told in popular culture. Fungicides don't mutate. What happens is a resistant one may emerge, and it's more likely due to random mutation inside the fungus or maybe being too closely exposed to some UV light. The bigger the population, the greater the chance of one of these members to existing. The second phase, this is where fungicides actually act, on the selection phase, and determine what remains after an application. And then that is in the establishment. If you leave something behind, um, it can become established. And so that's what we're gonna look at in this brief area. And just to mention before, the fungicides are not inherently mutagenic, mutations are pre-existing. It's uh, often a misconception that the materials that we have on the market cause mutation. 
and it's not necessarily the case. And advantageous, mu advantageous mutations that would lead to fungicide resistance occur infrequently. But if you keep your population down, if you keep the hospital clean, you keep the cows um, areas clean, all of the different types of organisms that get resistance to drugs um, won't occur if there's no members around to become resistant. That's something to think about. Sanitation is key for fungicide resistance. And as before, we mentioned the application of the fungicides doesn't cause emergence. It's just a selecting for the conditions that lead to establishment. There's a ton of work on this area about the idea of dose and mixtures. In many instances, these studies are done in wheat, but apples get applied and treated more frequently than wheat. Sometimes wheat never gets treated at all for the most part. We rely entirely on um, um, resistance, but other places that do, Humans get treated frequently for resistance, and animals get treated with fungicides for resistance, and apples get treated a lot. So we're more like those I would be um, willing to offer. So the first hypothesis is that you have two, um, the low dose is resistance causing it to develop more slowly. The idea being is you put a low dose application of a fungicide, and after the application, you have a lot of sensitive members because they just weren't killed. The dose wasn't strong enough, and then the resistant one is hanging out here as well. And the goal being, in this case, the competition between the sensitive and resistance sl slows down selection for this resistant one. Okay, super. All right. And in this case, we can't really tolerate this one in apple because if we have a whole bunch of apple scab on the fruit, you can't sell it. So this doesn't necessarily work for us as a tool. Now, the other idea is that what about high dose? And this is what is often used in medicine, veterinary medicine, and um, human medicine. As you go in and you put a high dose of the fungicide on, okay, yes, oh no, you do have one left over. Maybe it's resistant. You know, maybe it didn't make it because the dose is too high. The idea being, at least in the apple world, is that this is so low, it's not going to have enough inoculum potential or it won't be able to survive on its own to cause disease. And so these are the hypotheses we're testing. And in the uh, study, we uh, use this in this particular case. And this happened right around the time BASF was labeled, um, using these products. So they're not necessarily at the final labeled rates that we would know today, but we tried a lot of different things. We tried Circadus by itself, high and low, and then we tried Maravon, which is a mixture. And we had a different mixture, which is let's not have the Praclostrobin component, let's use Circadus and Mancozab. And it turns out that the BASF products were per perfect for this type of study because they uh, have different uh, levels of freedom in how they work. And what we do this time is we look at the labels and they're allowed uh, up to four applications, but no more than two consecutive applications in the US. So we targeted them at the best possible times to manage apple scab. In the case of the United States in the Eastern uh, part of the continent where we're working is pink and bloom and first and second cover. This is where things really get awful. And in the middle, we put protectant fungicides just to keep the populations down. And um, we collect a lot of lesions and we do a lot of fungicide sensitivity assays. And we did this over many seasons in a row, and we're continuing to do this work. Oh, no. Oh, finally, looks like my slides are advancing. It got stuck for a bit. So after three years of doing this in the same plots over and over again, what we ended up seeing is that a high rate of circadus is quite good. Um, there's the untreated, nothing. So no selection at all. We got the low, an orchard one, and you know there's a little bit of creep over here. But in this orchard here, um, we noticed that you know, cultivars are different. These are two different cultivars, two different isolates. The low dose was allowing things to really creep away in a quantitative sense, which became very scary, while the high dose was um, keeping the selection fairly low. Um, you can kind of see that more isolates with higher percent relative growth, the greater this number, the more resistant you are. And this is sort of the percentage of isolates there. Um, the other thing that was really nice is that, you know, uh, mixtures are great, and if you look at control, they're looking very good, and then the curves for either using Circadus with Mancozab or just using Maravon by itself was awesome, and yes, there is a little bit of, of movement towards um, a decrease in sort of quantitative susceptibility or sensitivity of the fungi. It's just creeping away a little bit, but they're both equally well, so you could include, you could just use a protectant, or if protectants like Mancozab were becoming um, less favored, then you could use Maravon and do an excellent job of resistance management using these materials after the same years. And to put it in perspective, using a single material with nothing else in it at all really shifted things at a low dose much greater than using something like uh, Maravon or including a protectant with your SDHI. And so to sort of summarize that last little portion, 
Um, no practical resistance, which means in the case of practical resistance means you put the product out in a growers in an orchard and you had a failure. I didn't show you the disease data, but all the tools um, managed apple scab fairly effectively. And and we've done this all the way to four years. We're going to five years. No mutations in any of the genes, so they're all clean. There's just a slight shift, and those shifts um, are in quantitative responses. And there could be other things outside of the target site that might be shifted for any fungicide use, not necessarily specific to the ones that we have. That could be multi-fungicide resistance mechanisms. But we found that the low dose was definitely um, not as effective. And this sort of um, goes along with what we see in medicine and human and veterinary medicine as well. And it also really in, 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 um, and sort of emphasizes importance, either mixing fungicides or using a premix like the full Maravon product to sort of maintain levels of population sensitivity. For the final phase, we will talk about some of the work we're doing now to integrate biopesticides and single site fungicides. Right now, there's a, a tendency to want to rely on synthetic multi-site protected fungicides. Whoa, what are those types of things? Um, these are things like Captan and Mancozeb, effective in heavily large quantities. They have no potential for fungicide resistance because they're going after a whole bunch of different target sites, but they're less environmentally um, friendly and there are use restrictions placed in other countries, maybe including Canada at this point. And we often give talks at the Ontario Expo, and um, we thought this was a good opportunity to see if we could mitigate this. Um, what's nice is that multi-site biological controls are more environmentally friendly, but typically less effective. Well, what is effective? Succinate dehydrogenase inhibitors like the Maravon product, highly effective, but we're scared of fungicide resistance. And the goal being is can we find a way to integrate biopesticides instead of stuff like Captan and Mancozeb and reduce reliance on these and still get acceptable disease control? So we've tried this in a couple of different ways. We're working on with an SDHI fungicide and the subtilis in this particular instance. And we're looking at two different using planting system to really help us out. In the old days when um, pathologists used to evaluate biological controls, they do it in a tree that's probably three times the size of this and they conclude that they no longer work. But what about smaller trees, um, smaller super spindle trees that we're sort of having in that most of the industry in New York is transitioning to? Better fungicide coverage, better drying time, less microclimate, more con less conducive to the growing of apple scab. And so we've tried to blend these um, using modern planting systems and decision aid support systems. So we have models that tell us when the infection events are coming. What if we could use these to aid in effective uh, fungicide application? And, um, and use these preventatively so that the best materials are out there. And um, this is sort of what we've been working with um, right here. We have nothing, um, Manzate and CapTech, rotated biweekly with SDHIs, and doing this on a calendar, doing this with decision aid support. And then we just started moving Serenade in there with SDHIs on a calendar and decision aid support system. And these are sort of simplified grower programs right there. They really rely heavily on these, but they rarely use those. And, um, and some of our experimental programs are here swapping out the CAP-10 for a biological that has a history of successful use. We do two training systems and we do bi-weekly fruit ratings and AUDPC calculations in two years. And we're doing it for a third. And in this particular instance, um, every seven days and every third week for the single site, um, of the SDHI, and then with the weather-based ones, we have a threshold event where we only use the SDHI material at a really, really heavy um, infection period. And you can kind of see how this played out in this calendar schedule. We only used two of them and relied on a bunch of those. And here, because in 2019, we had that high inches of rainfall, 15 to 17 inches, we had to have a two additional ones to really focus on it. But and then in 2020, similar thing with the less rainfall, it really warranted only three applications. And um, for the most part, growers in the United States will use about uh, four, typically, of an SDHI fungicide. The two systems, um, in terms of 90% relative humidity, is really conducive to infection. And our decision aid support system uses this as a measure of how much um, leaf wetness that we have. And so we also had um, sensors in the trees. And then you can see just by switching to these other systems, you have less relative humidity overall in the super spindle. This is a fairly open vertical axis and fewer days that well, there was um, greater than 90% relative humidity, if you will. You can kind of see four, um, which can make the difference in the end. 
And if you look at the AUDPCs, this is a unitless number and can get into the 5,000s if there's a lot of apple scab untreated. And then you have the various programs. And then the key to take away is, is that one necessarily isn't better than another, other than like the calendar schedule we found to be more deleterious, particularly when we started substituting out Captan and Mancozab, which made me suggest that maybe applying fungicides on a calendar schedule is not necessarily the best plan. And the uh, and this is sort of the leaves, similar situation. You're really seeing that calendar schedule not go well when you have to swap out. And it seems to be better to time the applications at the intense events. 2020, we didn't have a lot of apple scab. You can see the numbers have dropped from 100 to, I mean, 5,000 to into the 40s with a lot of stuff. In this instance, it really wasn't that useful of an era. When you look at the vertical axis, and you're like, oh gosh, look at the differences. But these are really, we're talking about one to two lesions in the entire set of replicated plots. And and also we include some uh, other um, controls as well. We've done it with and without, the, you know, the Bacillus only and the SDHI only. And yes, of course, um, we're carrying a lot of weight and you can still see the trends. But, you know, and I don't show, this is just on um, leaves. There's just no fruit scab in 2020 this year, but we're going into the next year and uh, checking it out. And so in terms of uh, selection of resistance, we also looked at resistance in these and to see whether or not there was any resistance selection whatsoever. We do sort of the stuff, but for the most part, um, it seemed that the insensitivity being indicated by higher growth was um, worse when you were applying SDHIs at a calendar schedule as opposed to disease forecasting. And sort of just to wrap everything up for today, um, for the most part, um, if you use an alternation, uh, a biopesticide could be used to replace Captain and Mancozeb. If you know you're fastidious and you do a good orchard and you have small trees and you have modern planting systems and everything else is there. And it's been able to manage apple scab in two drastically different seasonal conditions. And there is also potential that by using the Cisionate support system, you could reduce the level of insensitivity or selection for resistance in your SDHI component. And um, and there's again, it's just the greatest potential for these things to work if we have uh, systems that are less uh, um, conducive. And with that, I will go ahead and unshare my talk. Yep, the super spindle and whatever decision aid support system that you have. So I'll push this button here and that should remove me from the talk and then we can, I'll mute myself and we can go to the next person. Perfect, thanks, Carrick. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Hopefully. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so as I said at the beginning, my name's Anne McCray. I work for BASF as a technical specialist in horticulture crops. And I'm just going to uh, follow Carrick's presentation. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, with a little bit of information on Maravon, uh, seeing as it's new for us here in Canada for this year. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the active ingredients and also some of the details around uh, rates and things like that for here in Canada. So, uh, as Carrick mentioned, this has Maravon has two modes of action, which uh, most people will probably be familiar with. The first one being Zemium, that is found in BASF products Circadus, and also Paracostropin, which is the group uh, 11 strobilurine. So we today we are talking uh, about apples and kind of focusing on apples, but I also wanted to mention that Maravon is registered on a broad range of crops and diseases, um, palm fruit that includes pears as well, as well as berries, your stone fruit, and lots of uh, vegetable crops. So just so you're aware, feel free to check out the label for the, our large expansion of crops. So I want to, as I mentioned, go into a little more detail on the active ingredients uh, for those that are not familiar. So the first being Zemium, the group seven or SDHI that Carrick has been talking about. Basically, um, the majority, how Zemium works uh, when it is applied onto the leaf surface is that it's not taken up immediately, but kind of binds firmly to the waxy layer and creates these depots. And Zemium can be redistributed from these depots, ensuring it's sort of continuous uptake or slow release. So 
the zemia migrates towards the tips of the leaves, um, and on its way, it pervades the entire cross-section of the leaf. And thanks to its excellent distribution, the zemium also can protect those parts of the leaf that were not reached maybe during that spray application, which gives it this excellent scab and powdery mildew control. So that is the group seven part of Marivon, which would also be the active ingredient in Circadus. Next is uh, paracostrobin, which is the group 11, strobal urine. This is a QOI uh, enzyme inhibitor that's uh, the same as all group 11s. But the special part about paracostrobin is that it also helps improve plant health, growth deficiencies, and stress tolerance. And so many of you have maybe heard us talk a little bit about this when we are talking about pristine. But I wanted to go into a little bit of detail around this and how um, there is actual research to sort of back this up. I know a lot of times it's something that uh, growers are maybe seeing and it's talked about, but we did want to show that there's actual science sort of behind uh, this, these plant health benefits. So to start off with uh, just a little bit of background, all crops use sunlight and photosynthesis as we know, to convert carbon dioxide to sugars that are stored in the plant as energy for growth. But at night, plants undergo respiration. So converting some of this stored energy back into carbon dioxide. And our research has shown that the paracostrobin treated plants, um, so paracostrobin being in Marivon, are more efficient in converting energy, which can preserve energy for increased growth. We also see improvements in the utilization of nitrogen, which is an essential nutrient for growth. And in research studies, treated trees allow the plant to take up more nitrogen and build these stronger plants with more energy and nutrients. Increased growth efficiency is seen in stronger stems or greener leaves and crops with higher yields and quality pot potential. Uh, Something else we also see is around the stress tolerance. So in addition to the increased growth efficiency, research shows that paracostrobin treated plants also react differently to any stresses. When treated plants experience a stress, they produce ethylene, uh, to, uh, which is a signal for um, the plant to stop growth and kind of shut down. The plant loses its color or can drop leaves or drop blooms. Um, in these paracostrobin treated crops, these stress signals are, can be reduced. So research shows um, that in products such as Marivon or Pristine, crops are better able to tolerate short periods of minor cold or heat or drought stresses. And these treated crops remain greener and more productive even under stressful conditions. And we do have uh, some apple specific examples of that. Um, in this case, there was a frost event and uh, paracostrobin uh, product was treated before that frost event where uh, when you didn't, for the tree on the left here, this did not have the paracostrobin tree on the right did. So although it did not save all the blooms, it did save quite a few. So we went from no apples to you still have some apples. And in this case, this, this was actually stone fruit, but it was interesting because we treated half the tree. So on the left-hand side, it was not treated. On the right-hand side, it was treated. Uh, here, because of the frost event, uh, it um, basically, if the blooms are still living, but because you put the tree under stress, they will still drop their blooms. So what paracostrobin does is it gives those blooms a chance. Basically, it tells them not to abort. And so you still end up with more blooms. So it's not, uh, if you get a severe cold and a freeze and it actually kills the blossoms, we don't bring anything back to life, <laughs> but we can help mitigate stress. So if it's created enough stress on those blooms that they die, then your Marivon application can help to sort of decrease stress to keep those blooms alive. Okay, so now I did want to just cover, um, now we've kind of talked about the two active ingredients. I wanted to go over some of the key features uh, that will be on, that are on the Marivon label. Um, a lot of these 
Carrick actually brought up because they are similar to the U.S. Um, I have our rates here in liters per hectare, but actually they're they're fairly similar to the ounces rate in the U.S. If you if if anybody is wondering, we also are only allowed a max application of four and no more than two se sequential. Um, that goes because it is a group seven. Uh, we have hand harvest is for PHI is, is five days, and then hand thinning. 12 days for a re-entry, but all other activities are 12 hours. Um, we do, uh, there will be some wording on the label around tank mixing with um, some oils. So we encourage you to just talk to our to BASF rep before your tank mixing. Um, there have been, a num we have not tested it on everything, and there ha it has been used in the US for a number of years now without um, any concerns, but in some trial work that was done early on in the U.S., they used certain oils that caused a little bit of in injury, but was, um, so there is a caution around that, just to be aware. So as uh, Carrick also pointed out, this is an excellent apple scab product. Uh, we've done a uh, lot of testing, and they have lots of experience in the U.S. now to show that this is a key product in growers' apple scab programs. And um, you've already seen uh, lots of data, so I won't focus too much on this, but this is kind of comparing some SDHI chemistries and controlling apple scab on the left and then powdery mildew on the right. And uh, lastly, I wanted to uh, kind of put this slide together to go over because I've been talking about a few different uh, products here, but I did want to point out that sort of looking at a program approach from the ASF perspective, we have Marivon, Circadis, and Sevia. And I've put in here uh, all our products in black would have a group seven. So you do have to be aware that when you are sort of planning your spray programs that because for all group sevens, you are only allowed four applications, you kind of have to plan out when you want to use these. So Circadis is the standalone group seven SDHI, so, and Marivon would be your group seven and 11, as well as Pristine. So Sevia, Circadis, Marivon are probably, are all excellent scab products. If apple scab is your key disease that you are after, um, I would recommend starting with Sevia and then going to Marivon. And if you need another uh, ap uh, application sort of in that bloom time, depending on how bloom, long bloom lasts in a particular year, uh, you could then switch back to Sevia. So you're doing a group three, a 711, and then you could add another group three. If you prefer to not have a group 11 early, then Circadis uh, on its own tank mixed with a protectant, preferably, so tank mix with someone, something for resistance management, and then you can rotate it with Sevia um, as well uh, because it is a group three. But keeping in mind also that Pristine and Marivon, if you want to use those for your summer disease or storage disease uh, products, that those have to be counted in your max of, of four group sevens. And both Marivon and Pristine um, work equally well on all of those sort of summer diseases. And then if you, uh, I know parts of the country are also more focused on powdery mildew is probably the one that they're more worried about than scab. In that case, I would start with Marivon and then you can switch to Sevia, of course, tank mixing Sevia with a protectant um, because it is a single mode of action. So these are just some of um, our recommendations from our uh, portfolio of Apple products. There are obviously a lot of other products out there too. I just encourage you to make sure you know which groups you're using and that you are re rotating them accordingly. So to kind of wrap everything up, I want to kind of thank everybody for uh, listening in today and joining us. And I really hope that you get a chance to Try Marivon this year. It's kind of our premium scab and powdery mildew product, and it offers you so a more consistent disease control for that maximum 
palm fruit yield and quality. And I will now turn it over so we can do some Q&A. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anne. And thanks to you as well, Carrick. If you are okay with it, let's turn on our webcams. So yes, thank you both so much. Um, that was a lot of excellent information in a very short amount of time. So let's jump into the Q&A. Um, does Maragon have MRLs established for export? Uh, I don't know if either of you want to take this first, but uh, let's go with Anne. Yeah, I can cover that. So yeah, the nice thing about Maravon is that it has been registered in the US for five plus years. Um, so we do have uh, most export MRLs established. Uh, most of them are sort of harmonized with Canadian, uh, including Codex and things like that. So yes. So if there's specific countries that anyone needs, then they can contact me and we have an MRL specialist or they can easily go into the your whatever database that you are normally checking and they should be there. Excellent. Um, is it okay to tank mix Maravon with biological products? Um. Yeah, so I can, I know from uh, kind of our side, sometimes it's your best to talk to the person um, that, sort of the, I guess the company that is selling the biological product. There are, we do have a biological, it doesn't have apples on the label, but for our other crops we have tested that Maravon is safe to tank mix and we haven't had any issues. Um, so as far as we know it is, but it's probably best to make sure you're talking to the rep that covers that product. Excellent, uh, anything to add, Karen? Or? Yeah, the only thing I will add is um, one time, some of the materials that Ario Basidium is incredibly popular to use for fire blight control, particularly in the Pacific Northwest and here as well but there's a lot of concern that since it's a fungus that it might be killed by single site um, uh, materials and so in that case um, I mean a, a good rule of thumb is if the biological is a fungus don't mix it with the fungicide yeah I mean in that case you may want to space them apart and that's been a, a barrier in the eastern U.S. for wanting to use biologicals that were that are fungi less so than using something like Maravon Okay. Um, for either of you. I either lost sound or you were muted. No. Okay. Yeah, I missed it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll speak up. Have you ever mixed Maravon with dormant oil and closer? Uh, hmm. No dormant oil, but I have mixed it with NISs, usually just because I'm not using Maravon at a time when oil went out uh, at, at that early. It's usually copper and oil in the U.S. Okay. Yeah, the only um, oil that we know there was an issue is around methylated seed oil, so um, there are so many different options out there we definitely have not tested all of them so we would encourage them to check that first okay um and the, what is the half-life of marathon go ann <laughs> <laughs> that uh i don't know i would have to look into that one <laughs> and get back to them all right thank you uh does Maravon protect fruits as well as leaves for the, I'm thinking this means second infection. Yeah, I, I find that uh, um, all of the SDHIs in general work uh, best prior to germination. There's a little bit less effect of us later on. And so maybe the differences that you might see in tissue uh, or could be related to secondary infections typically might be going out when things are germinating more frequently but for the most part we generally get better fruit control than we do leaf control but it's not specific to Maravon it's with any of the materials that we would use so sorry just asking for clarification on one of the questions um let's jump back 
Uh, will Marivon work on diseases like Marsonia leaf blotch or glomerella, glomerella leaf spot if it becomes an emerging disease issue? If I can uh, answer that one, yeah. Um, right now in North Carolina and some of the southern states where climate change has come, these two diseases have really caused trouble and they're incredibly um, probably more important in China than apple scab. And these products work, uh, Marivon in particular, is I think the North Carolina's go-to material for both of those diseases. And they're only sad that they can't apply it more than four times, I would say, because it there's a lot of, there are very few that work really well, even in the SDHI family. And that one in particular is uh, very good. Uh, Marivon in particular is very good against these sort of new emerging diseases. And um, unfortunately, they can't use it in organic, which is where we often see the problems with those other two coming in. Okay. Uh, sorry, Anne, anything to add? No, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> I was good. Um, Captain asks, is Marivon better for powdery mildew or for scab? I know it's kind of hmm. for both, but... <laughs> Well, um, hmm. it's the, one of the best materials that we have on both of them. I would say against the fungus itself, the Praclostrobin is very effective against um, powdery mildew. Um, but in the, I mean, compared to the DMIs in the 80s, uh, there's nothing that could compare with that. You know, in the 80s, um, people have talked about being able to hang a tissue in a greenhouse and have all the powdery mildew disappear. But, you know, in from that perspective, I would say it's better against scab, but it's one of the best materials that we have against powdery mildew presently uh, across the board. So I don't think it's going to get much better than than something like uh, Marivon. And then the new DMI seem to be really are, are aren't as soluble and they're not as effective against powdery mildew as the older ones. But the older ones, even though they're maybe more soluble, are more susceptible to the resistance that has developed in powdery mildew. So in this case, if I was going after powdery mildew, I would definitely run with Marivon. Yep, I would agree with that. And for um, our recommendations, Marivon's always our first for uh, powdery mildew. Excellent. All right. Have you mixed Marivon with any insecticides? So I mean, we... I... Yeah, go ahead, Anne. No, I was just going to say there, um, uh, because there's so many products out there, we can't uh, test them all. Uh, we generally do um, different formulations, make sure we're checking different formulations to make sure that it will be okay. And we haven't had any watch outs as far as compatibility goes. And because it's in, been in the U.S. for a number, a number of years now, and nobody has come to us and said, wow, that was really terrible. Like it's been done really excellent, so I'm not aware of that, but we haven't specifically tested it. Yeah. I mean, I'll add that we've done a lot of trials where we've attempted to, after the potential injury between um, Fontella's captan and oils that occurred in the U.S. a couple of years ago, we've tried a lot of work with a lot of materials, particularly at petal fall. Um, and in petal fall, the growers are trying to thin, they're trying to manage insects, and they're trying to manage diseases, and we've seen issues in complex tank mixes with other products, but never Marivon. We find that to be one of the more uh, friendly ones to use, even if you have a slurry in the tank of, you know, um, foliar nutrients and other things. We find that to be one of the best ones in terms of having compatibility in large tank mixes. So I, I if I was gonna go with one, that was, a, I feel like that would be a safe bet. <laughs> Uh, with late sprays on fruit, will it help with storage rots? <laughs> it, it works great. As a matter of fact, in the U.S., if we have our zero-day PHI, I usually recommend growers saving um, applications of Marivon for that last, because the REI is so low. I mean, in theory, you could spray it the day before in the U.S. and harvest it the next day. And we've done studies um, where we take them into the lab and either inoculate them or leave them in cold storage and the fruit always come out interestingly in some cases even more red um, we have a handheld um, spectrophotometer that measures that sort of food industry grade and 
we often find that some of these, uh, and we've often speculated that the praclostrobin component that contributes to the other things that Anne showed may actually influence this. And so statistically at a spectrophotometer level, they seem to be more red and less um, less hampered by post-harvest pathogens, at least some of the studies that we've run. Okay. Um, you mentioned not relying on calendar schedule. So is it just a matter of keeping up with scouting and tracking when these major events are happening, or is it is there something more predictable than that? Um, yeah, and so right now, if you have a decision aid support system um, and you have the agility, if you have 5,000 hectares of apples, you, you have to do the calendar schedule because on day one, you might be starting it, and by day seven, you're finally finishing your spray for the week. Um, it really depends on your level of agility, but if you subscribe to something like the RIMPRO model or, or if you have a decision aid support system in your area, um, using that to define the biggest infection periods and then focusing your best materials then and then relying on, you know, maybe biologicals or something else. That's what we've found. And we've just started to note now that every time we've looked at calendar, I think um, the potential for selection and other factors seem to be occurring because it's not the best time to manage the pathogen. It's either a little bit before or a little bit after. And if you can think about, let's just say, the half-life of any material, if you're not perfectly matched up, you're going to be creeping in on that half-life one way or another. And you effectively might even be technically reducing your rate as the material degrades. I mean, we don't want the materials to stay around forever. So we find that that extra level of precision might be all that one really needs to um, do a better job all around. It just depends on your operation and how agile you are. Fair enough. Uh, um. What pH do you recommend for Maribon? Uh, uh, Anne, let's go with you. Yeah, so um, we have, uh, I mean, it's been, it's kind of fairly safe on a wide range of pHs, so uh, like we don't have a sort of specific recommendation. Um, I don't know if Carrick has like experience with looking at pHs, but from uh, what we've seen, I think, um, I'd have to look on the specific numbers, but there's not, it's pretty wide range. Yeah, I've used all types of water, um, straight from the municipal, straight from groundwater, and I've never had any issues. Uh, a lot of people want to put adjuvants with Maravon, but I tend to find it best by itself. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, this might require a bit of interpretation. Uh, is Maravon okay to apply with nutrients at pink? Um, I've been doing it. But okay. No, no injury. Yeah, ever. I was gonna say you get anything on your end. <laughs> no, uh, like as far as we know, uh, again, kind of similar to the others. You know, we can't, we haven't tested everything at specific times, but because it's been used for so many years in the U.S. Um, and we haven't had any negative feedback, then that's kind of what we're going on. Uh. For pre-harvest applications, will pristine work as well as Maravon, as well as the possibility of more red apples out of storage as well? I don't know about, I would, uh, I potentially, I've only really tested this with Maravon because of some data that we were first doing with uh, Bayer, and then I showed BASF, and we started doing similar studies, and we've really focused on um, Maravon since it seems to be all around a stronger Apple product for us with the new with that new SDHI. Yeah, so from I'm I don't know around the redness. Uh, that was hasn't been something we've looked at. Uh, we did look at comparing Maravon and Pristine uh, to storage diseases this uh, summer, and saw that they both worked equally as well as far as disease control. Um, and I know that Pristine is used quite a bit. Uh, here in Canada in, in certain parts. So uh, from what we could see, we didn't uh, notice any differences. They both worked really well, um, but I don't know about the fruit color. Okay. Um, this will probably be more for Anne. I know that Mencozeb has gone through reevaluations recently. Uh, does that affect any, uh, like, 
alternating use with Maravon, or does that affect Maravon applications at all as, as like a use partner? Um, I don't like so it won't affect or change anything as far as you can still only use for group seven applications. Uh, so you kind of have to be strategic of, on when you're going to do that. Um, Maravon does have two modes of action, so you could use it on its own. You don't have to use like a Mancazeb with it, so that might save you one of the applications for for Mancazeb. So, but other than that, I, I they probably don't really. Uh, thank okay. each other. Okay. Um, the person asks, uh, should they not use it near grapes? I know it's registered for grapes. So uh, it is registered on grapes. Uh, there, if you check the label, there are some varieties that we uh, do recommend not using Maravon on, but I, I don't think that should deter you from using apples that are near grapes. <laughs> um, if that's if that's the thing. Yeah, they added uh, drift and low wind speed recommended. So I don't know if that is that right. just a just to reduce. Yeah, make sure you're not drifting. Okay. Cool. And time for one more question. So if one doesn't appear momentarily. Oh, um, not sure how applicable this is. Are there any apple varieties that are less receptive to marijuana use or like its effects? Mm, not that I know of. I mean, I, we um, one of the things that we have is we have an advanced breeding selection plot for the breeder, which we test with fire blight. And there's so many wild accessions and all kinds of stuff. And sometimes breeding programs will have given me apple varieties to put in there and I mean, we routinely treat that block with Maravon and it's not like we've seen it fail or not do well or anything in that. So I would imagine that's um, quite effective. And it also gets used at the germplasm repository in, in Geneva as well. So um, it's not like all of a sudden there's a Maravon program and one apple's covered with scab or something. No, I, I don't think there'd be any issues or FIDO with that. It probably would get brought to our attention or we'd notice it. And one final question. Do we know if the codex PHI will be the same as pristine? Um, so codex is based on uh, maximum residue limits uh, numbers. So I don't know how that relates um, to PHI specifically. Uh, it would kind of, we'd have to compare sort of Canadian MRL versus a Codex MRL and see if they're harmonized, which um, I can look into if, uh, if you have the person's contact information, I can tell them. Sure, yeah. Um, Corey, if you'd like to follow up with him, go for it. But at this moment, uh, before we end today, I'd like to remind you all that the registered attendees will be receiving a follow-up email from us for the recording of today's webinar approximately 24 hours from now. But at this moment, I'd like to once again thank BISF for sponsoring today's webinar and thank you both, Eric and Anne, for speaking today. Uh, please be sure to visit fruitandvegetable.com slash webinars for information about future webinars. And with that, again, thank you both and everyone else, have a great day. Thanks.